the first thing I want to say <laughs> is uh, we met on the uh, set of Bill Maher. And right. I had known your business and known your career. And you have correctly assessed uh, the midterm elections, many other elections, but you were spot on on the midterms. Uh, but I'm going to read your bio very quickly. Uh, Rachel Bykoffer is a nationally recognized election forecaster and a senior fellow at the Niskanen Center in Washington, D.C., where in addition to her groundbreaking election analysis and election forecasting research on the presidential and congressional elections, she conducts pro-democracy research. Rachel's work appears in a variety of the nation's leading media outlets, including the New York Times, the Washington Post, Politico, Market Watch, The Guardian, the BBC, MSNBC, Sky News, CBC, and my favorite, Real Time with Bill Moore. And by the way, unlike you, Rachel, he happens to love you and he loved you from day one. He was making fun of me on the show uh, when I was a Trump supporter. Um, she is the host of the Election Whisperer, which is a database politics and election show that Rachel says is the election nerd Disneyland for wonks with a good sense of humor. And you certainly have that. You're a senior advisor on the Lincoln Project. I did Lincoln Project TV last night. I really enjoyed that. So, so Rachel, first of all, you've had, a, you've had a fabulous career. You've been spot on on so many things, but I love asking people this in the beginning. How did you get to be where you are and what drove you to go in the direction that you've taken your life? You know, that's a really great question. And actually it's good because my career has really been very short. I, I, and that's because I, did, I, I delayed growing up like Peter Pan. <laughs> I, I, um, I, that's because I was a, really interested in, in hanging out and partying when I was a teenager. And I didn't have parents that went to college. So college, was, and this was like, this is like, you know, um, I'm a Gen X, like oh, in between Gen X and, and, and front end millennial. So you didn't, everyone didn't go to college. And so my parents didn't really focus on sending people to college. And so I didn't go to college. And instead I went to Grateful Dead shows, like lots of them in the early nineties. And that's what I was really focused on doing. Um, and I so graduated- where'd you grow up? Like what town did you grow up in? In the mid Atlantic. So like we, we, you know, my dad had been in the Navy and he graduated, um, he uh, res uh, retired and I was the youngest. So I didn't get as much Navy moving, but you know, because of that, we lived in Virginia, like Spain, Virginia, and then moved to Maryland. So it's like North of DC in a place called Walkersville, which is yeah, a little sure. bit outside of Frederick. Right. Yep, yeah. I know where that yeah, is. Yeah. And yeah. all I cared about was getting the hell out of there. <laughs> All right, so well, I, all right. All right. So you're yeah. you're you're at the Grateful Dead concert. You're not going yeah. to college, but you end sure. up as this brilliant pollster. So yeah, and I, through, I don't do it that. at all until I, you know, I'm like 20. I go out. I I go, like I go and do other things, and I get a, a job as a HR manager in a polling firm um, out west in Oregon. And I'm 24. I'm a single mom. And I don't want to be broke forever. And I'm also realizing I'm actually like unusually smart. It was just that I had better things to do in school before, which was, you know, AKA not go to school and, and party. So I, I go to college, right? And I go to a community college because that's where you go when you're working class and don't have connections. And so, um, and I realized pretty quick, I'm going to have a huge passion for politics and current events. And, and I'm, you know, not sure if I want to do, do it all. Or, um, you know, I find out, like, you know, how to become a professor is, is a really hard path, but I, I'm interested in doing it. I really wanted to be doing this. Like, I wanted to be, I, I would watch TV analysts, and I, I was like, you know, I think I could do that. Uh, but I didn't think that was too, too likely to occur. But I thought being a professor would be a, a nice kind of like second, you know, more achievable version of life. And so I, I did. I, I went and did you know, community college, working full time the whole day, raising a kid on my own young child, uh, and then moved out to Georgia to, to, to do my PhD because that's the place that accepted me with funding. And I only finished in 2015. And then my, you know, my first year teaching was the 2016 cycle. So I always tell people I'm an accidental election forecaster. What I was studying was political polarization. And then you know, I um, come out of that 2016 election, having like had all these observations about elections and the way they were being analyzed and the way people were talking about them. 
um, realizing that like people were looking at squares where I was seeing triangles predominantly because of all of this expertise about uh, polarization. And that's when I kind of stumbled into the path that you now have found me on. Okay, but you seem to be like, and I, and I hope this is, I'm, I'm saying this as a compliment. Some people say the word savant and it's not a compliment, but you are a savant on this stuff. You have a knack for this stuff. Uh, and it, it, it's something that like Simon Cow would call the X factor, where you're actually seeing something that other people don't see. And so I'm going to get right to the 2020 presidential election. And I'd like you to lay out for people your narrative of what you think is going on in the body politic and how do you think things will shape up? And we know it's a moving target. So, uh, you know, where, where are we today? Where do you think we'll be November 3rd? Uh, right, and right. how do we get to where we are? And really, I mean, that's a big part of my research is that it's not a, it's not a moving target like it used to be, right? Uh, and that's because of hyperpartisanship and polarization. And even with a massive event, as something that is, you know, even if it had been decently managed, and it, and it certainly wasn't, uh, the pandemic is a massive political event. It has also accompanied with a second massive political event, which is this economic event that goes along with it. And everywhere around the world, uh, the public that um, you know goes in a country, you can see the effect of the event on public opinion because it registers either positively or negatively pretty significant changes in public opinion. There's only one country in which that's an exception. Of course, I mean, I'm talking about countries with free and fair you know, information systems. There's only one place in which that's different and that's the United States of America. Like public opinion is almost completely inelastic here. And that is a sign of a very sick body politic. Uh, but it does actually make forecasting, election analysis, things like that, uh, much easier, right? When things are, are going to be set in stone or pretty fundamentally um, concrete for months on end and nothing can, even a pandemic can move somebody away from, um, you know, an incumbent president, no matter how poorly managed it is, it does make it easier to, to kind of guess where things will be. And so what I said in March, as I wrote my September, my March update, I said, I won't update this forecast again until September. So that's coming out in a couple of weeks. But my expectation is a, this pandemic will not be managed well by Donald Trump because he has, you know, incompetencies that are just, that, that made him always unqualified for the job of presidency, which doesn't have a hiring process that's, you know, um, elite driven, it's mass driven, so he, he could get hired anyway. Uh, but he's probably not going to handle this ideally. Uh, and so my assumption is, you know, though, that that's, that won't matter the way it did in 1980 when Carter um, faced an inflation crisis, an Iran-Contra crisis, didn't handle those things well, and then got shellacked. We're not going to see that kind of movement. We will see some penalty, uh, and we have, right? We've seen some additional erosion in pure independence and some right-leaning independence, and I'll be really showing voters that uh, or people that in the uh, September update. But by and large, you know, Trump's still like 42, 43 percent, 41 percent. I mean, it's almost inelastic and it's amazing. It's amazing because it's um, unique in the world to see uh, a, a political event of this magnitude have almost no effect on public uh, opinions, assessments. And uh, it's a um, we can talk about why and how it functions, but it's something that I yeah. So I, 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 if you don't mind, I would love to know your theory on it. I mean, I've heard you say this. Uh, you know, he has a high floor, but he also seems to have a yes low ceiling, right? I, I think that was your comment, right? It's sort of like a bandwidth that's very tight. Yes, and uh, nothing seems to move it. To use the president's own words, I can shoot people on Fifth Avenue. No one, no one is really breaking support from me. But the flip side is a good, you know, two thirds of the country seems to disagree with the way he handled the pandemic. That pandemic, that's a, a polling that I've seen. So, why do you think it is this way? Why do you think there's that level of rigidity in the polling? So, the, you know, in particular, broadly speaking, it is you know, you people hear in the media um, and you know probably their own conversations these days that you hear the words uh, polarization. Maybe you hear the less common term hyperpartisan, but polarization certainly, those are not just buzzwords. These are quantifiable empirical characteristics that political scientists like myself have studied and documented. 
um, you know, starting really uh, with some very impressive quantification out of the U.S. Congress. Um, but, you know, it's been quantified in the courts, in the executive branch, and it took longer to quantify or find evidence to support quantif you know, quantified terms, empirical terms in the public, but eventually, you know, it really, um, you know, math, what we call mass polarization really starts to emerge in a big way, 2008, 2009, when two major events happen simultaneously, the uh, economy collapses and, uh, you know, Barack Obama gets elected. So it's really difficult to disentangle how much of each thing impacts uh, that movement. But we do know, I mean, at that point, uh, my dissertation, which is, you know, pushing back at, at a, a big book that's, you know, claimed to disprove mass polarization and other work, um, like by Pew uh, Center for the um, Pew, Pew Center's uh, public polling data, really starts to show definitively, no, 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 polarization is not just something in the elites, it's not just a product of, you know, having to choose between parties that are polarized, this is something voter that's affecting regular rank and file voters. And of course, that's what my forecasting work is about. It's about arguing to, you know, like the uh, election forecasting, you know, status quo. Hey, you can't have mass polarization and hyperpartisanship and then keep analyzing elections and expecting election um, behavior to not be severely impacted, uh, particularly in so far as like the persuasion elements of, of elections. What, what, what do you think is going to happen? Uh, so for months, uh, my, my for, forecast for the presidential election initially dropped 13 months ago, and it anticipated based on my forecasting work, which talks about how Democrats have a uh, numbers advantage, right? Uh, and this is a decision that was made by the Republican Party against its own advice. Uh, in 2013, it issued a report. It's known as the RNC autopsy. Uh, and Rance Priebus, who um, was the chair of the Republican National Committee at the time, commissioned this report post uh, Romney's loss to argue, look, the demographic realities of America, especially when we look at the millennial and Gen Z generations, are such that, you know, nativism especially, language that is a hostile to racial minorities, is going to be electorally costly. And we should uh, definitely moderate on the issue of immigration and um, also probably stop fighting cultural war issues around issues like gay marriage you know, in particular, because public opinion has changed dramatically. And when we think about pu public opinion on gay marriage, it's, it's one of the most astounding reversals that we've ever seen in a short you know, 10, 15 year period. Um, and you know, he, they commissioned this report, they put it out in the part, I mean, this is part of what the Republican Civil War is about, like half the party war. It's like, yeah, no, that's not gonna happen. Instead, we're gonna go the other way. We're gonna primary challenge, basically, the autopsy ascribers and remove them from office. And so we see this big you know, office purging of Republican establishment members, Eric Cantor, um, others. And then, of course, the fight for the soul of the party in that 2016 nomination fight and the um, takeover of the Republican Party by Trump, which is a new version of the Republican Party. Uh, that's why the party did not put out a new convention plank. It, the plank is, you know, Donald Trump, basically, right? And so we have a, we have seen, and, and this is, you know, if you look through the 245 years of America and plus the pre-American um, history, like a uh, time period, you know, you have party evolution. The Democrats went through something very similar in the 1960s when it lost its whole Southern, um, you know, wing of it, of the party collapsed, right? So parties are amorphous, they change over time. And the Republican Party has had an amorphous experience that we're living through, it's impacting our national politics. So um, I predicted Democrats were gonna have a massive reaction to the election of Donald Trump. And we're not just talking about Democrats. And when we say Democrats, a lot of people say base. Even if you do talk about the Democratic base, you're not talking about progressives. You're talking about progressives. You're talking about African-Americans. You're talking about college-educated women. You're talking about a pretty big group. But my research really is careful in its language and it talks about the coalition of Democrats because that encompasses, too, a pretty fair chunk of independents uh, because many independents are closet partisans, they lean left, they lean right. 
So when I talk about my um, work, I really like to use a coalitional term because this is important on the other side as well. There's a big coalitional um, factor for Republicans with right-leaning independents. That's especially important right now with so many like expatted Republicans floating out there who are not calling themselves Republicans right now. Um, but in any case, because we're, uh, Democrats kind of you know, we're floating through 2016 in a complacent mood and then got a big shock on election night, they, they are much less likely to go into 2020 with that level of complacency. That yeah. would be um, one like major issue. But on top of that, there's this concept in polarization called negative partisanship. And negative partisanship refers to um, feelings that you have about the opposition party which are grounded in your own partisanship. Um, and people like to think about it as hate, like I hate the other party, but it's also fear. And that's fear, like, you know, when you think about Republicans when Obama was in office and Obamacare is passed or whatever Obama would do, Republicans would feel, feel fearful of it. Or watching the RNC this week, is really the palpable fear of what would happen if uh, Democrats end up in charge of America, right? Um, so fear is a major factor for turnout, um, and Democrats don't do fear artificially. Republicans do great artificial fear, but Democrats don't. So we're going to see a huge turnout surge that I anticipated in 2018, four months before election, and that's what you know made my house forecast uh, unique wasn't the accuracy at the end, uh, which you know everyone was pretty much accurate at the end, but hard to forecast something at the end anyway. It was the four forward accuracy. It was the fact that it was four or five months away saying, hey, it's gonna be more like 42 seats and not 23 seats fighting for the flip, right? Um, and so it predicted um, a democratic win anyway. And then this pandemic happened. And now you said um, Donald Trump couldn't really do something he had this feeling, and that's true because when we were on Bill Maher, it was literally the last few days before the country shut down. Like it was like the last couple of days, and um, still couldn't really conceptualize a world with like how with this pandemic and how it would um, you know exist. But the fact is actually that if Donald Trump had handled the pandemic well, like let's say he had just made the same policy choices that all the other Western democracy leaders did, like Trudeau or Morrison in Australia, um, you know, Johnson eventually, even though he kind of screwed it up at the beginning, kind of, he kind of copied Trump and then was like, oh, well, maybe I shouldn't do it this way. Um, so let's say that he had done a national shutdown, all states at the same time for that first month, and then a, you know, massive, um, you know, uh, in, in the Defense Production Act, massive production of, of testing and PPE, and just did a slow reopen where, you know, things were very, I mean, Australia is very strict, right? When there's a flare up, everything gets shut back down. Let's say he had done that and America did not have this raging out of control pandemic and economic activity thus was able to kind of resume, right? Because what's in, it, it ultimately holding back economic activity is it's people like you and me that have money and we're too smart to go out and kill ourselves, right? We're not gonna go to a restaurant. We're not gonna go to a movie theater. You can open them all you want. We're not going to them. So it's like, it's demand driven. Um, so you have to contain the virus if you want to reinstate demand. Uh, and as economic people, I'm sure you guys understand what I'm, what I'm arguing here. So containment is such a critical component to economic relief. Um, so he didn't do that, right? But if he had done that, if he had managed this well, I actually disagree. It is true that in the normal course of things, he couldn't have improved his ceiling, but with something this spectacular, something this disruptive to people's lives and businesses, if he had managed it well, he actually, Democrats are more or less polarized, and this is just a quantifiable fact. And it's because the Democratic coalition is less ideological than the Republican coalition. It doesn't live in an alternative media system, you know, that's pretty um, intense on Fox News. It probably would have benefited him. And I think he honestly would have been fairly competitive, more competitive than my initial modeling would have had him. But of course, you know, he did not do 
But, but, but Rachel, I've been watching the Republican convention and they, they say that he's handled it brilliantly. And they say that uh, without him, more people would have died and he shut down China, the travel right. ban with China. And uh, so are you saying that the American people are not buying that narrative? So it, it's a fine narrative for everywhere that you have full control of people's information diet. And that's, a, and that's not an insignificant portion of the public because, and, and the social political scientists, I'm sure other social scientists as well, have documented this in study after study after study, and it has gone profoundly worse since Donald Trump came into the political stage and started telling people overtly, especially from um, a, a position of, of legitimacy as the president. I mean, that's a, an extremely powerful position that the rest of the media system is fake and, and what have you. But Republican identifiers in survey after survey tell pollsters, I only trust Fox News. I only watch Fox News. And, and that's a very different construct because we're not, number one, we're not talking about 5% of the public. We're talking about around 30% of all Americans only get information from one source, and that is Fox News, right? And Fox News, like when, you know, pandemic and, um, you know, all of that stuff is, is the major story, that's not what they're talking about. They're really focused on, you know, uh, this federal courthouse story in Portland or other things. Now, if you happen to be not consuming that, it's like the impeachment process or the house trial in Ukraine. You know, I monitor right-wing media very extensively and I try to get people on, not in that environment to understand, look, if it doesn't, if it doesn't break through over there, it doesn't happen, right? So like during that house hearing for Ukraine, the um, right-wing media was telling its audience that there was no evidence of, of misconduct produced from the House investigation. There was uh, only evidence that implicated Hunter Biden in wrongdoing, that Trump was exonerated in the process of, uh, you know, and, and, and other, in other, the rest of the world, headline after headline of just really compelling evidence, right, in that House um, hearing um, from the Ukraine investigation. So it's very, it's a very uh, unique process too, because in, in conservative um, audiences across the globe who don't have that media ecosystem, their perceptions of Trump's handling of the pandemic are very different. They're much more critical of it, obviously. So if you, if you don't have that concept, con uh, context though, you know, it's, it's not, how can you criticize something if you think it's going well and you don't have any other information? Okay, so Trump's gonna lose? So if the election was held today, there's absolutely no way that he could win an election in which, you know, everybody is voting either by mail or whatever they're doing, right? Um, and, you know, there's only so much disconnect you can have from polling data and reality, right? Um, so people are, you know, you know, oh, well, the polls were all wrong in 2016 and he won. Well, you know, there was actually quite clear, and I really would point people to read this Market Watch article that I put out a couple of weeks ago that walks through specifically what happened in 2016 with polling data, because actually the polling data was very, very clear. And again, I wasn't an analyst, and I say in the article, I, I don't know if I would have noticed this if I was an analyst. Okay, I hope so. I like to think I would have, but I can't say that I would have. I know I noticed it right away when I wrote my post book, but hindsight is 2020, definitely, right? But in my uh, analysis of 2016, when I went to write my book on the election, it was a, like a blaring fire alarm signal in the polling data that so many, a, a very large number of voters in every poll, national polls, state polls, were saying that they were undecided. And that is weird for presidential elections. Like usually, like we have this big theory in political science called minimal effects theory. And it's one of the most stable things, like if you're gonna go get a PhD in poli sci and study American politics, every PhD American politics seminar is going to cover this research. And it's called the minimal effects theory. And it talks about how campaigns, because of polarization and the strength of partisanship and how powerful partisanship is, that before there are candidates, 
before there are campaigns, most people have already made up their mind who they're going to vote for, and therefore campaigns have minimal effects, right? And so, like, you know, when you look at polling data in any other cycle, when you get close to election day, you should not be seeing undecideds above 10%, certainly. And like the more normal, um, you know, amount for the polarized era, especially, is, you know, six, seven percent. In 2016, like in poll after poll, it's 15 percent, 12 percent, 20 percent. Where is that now, Rachel? Where are the undersided now? It's at six percent. Like, it, like a lot of the poll, I have this huge spreadsheet that I'm tracking, like of all these different indicators, right? I'm, like, it's like Bettercoffer's secret tracking sheet. I mean, not all of the parts of it are secret, and this is definitely one of the things that isn't. I'm tracking the number of undecideds. Like, you have to wait a little bit to track a couple of things. You know, um, one of them is, like, how much, or when you have one party has a, a primary and the other one doesn't, you have to wait a little while to see, like, will people coalesce around the candidate that had a, that had a primary? Because um, otherwise you're measuring primary, like, animosity effects more than anything else. I had to wait a long time to be able to see, okay, are Democrats going to rally behind Biden or are they going to have similar issues with they, that they did with Clinton where, where they never quite, I mean, it was atypical. So that was another thing I talk about in this article was that third party defection where you see a state like Wisconsin with 7% of the electorate doing third party or write-in balloting in a state that went for Trump by 0.7, less than the point. I mean, these are massive, massive impacts on the 2016 election. And these, these noises in the data are not there in 2020. Third party balloting is much, much, much lower already. Undecideds are much, much lower. But when I'm like looking at like, okay, I wanna figure out, will Democrats consolidate around Biden because you've got this progressive base they have twice now been thwarted in their efforts for their socialist revolution, right? And, uh, you know, free tip, I mean, nominate somebody who's progressive, but not an actual socialist, and you might have actually succeeded. Um, uh, anyway, the, um, I wanted to see, like, oh, this is a major, like, weakness that can be exploited and would be, is, I mean, that's what the Death Star is all about, exploiting these um, disaffected Bernie people and trying to get them to lead it back, because, Donald Trump is not, he's got the ceiling and he can't get above 50% in Ohio, in Wisconsin, in Michigan, in Pennsylvania. So if your job is to reelect this dude, your job is to actually pull down the winning uh, vote share below a majority. It has to be a plurality race like it was in 2016 or straight up you cannot elect him, right? So like always, you know, if, if you're running the Trump campaign, it's always been like, okay, how can I recreate that scenario in 2016 where there was a lot of third party defection and you really wanted Bernie Sanders to run a competitive race, Bernie Sanders to lose, and people to be pissed off about it, right? right. And so I wanted to see- Well, well you don't have, we don't have that now though, right? No, I mean, we like don't. The Bernie, it's already, like the they, Bernie boys right. or whatever they yeah. call them, the Bernie band is, is with, uh, with Joe Biden. They have totally consolidated around let's, them let's, already. Let's, Let's talk about women for a second, the female voter. Is, is the female voter gonna be the determinant of the yes. election? Yes, I mean- one Tell that, us why. I think people, are, are we allowed to use salty language on the salt talk? Yes, you are allowed to use salty <laughs> language. Good, yes, you are. I know, I get although I, I Although I've never used salty language in my life. So, I never. You know, yes, That's I'm a very straight- you call reporters at home, right? <laughs> I'm a very straight-laced person. I mean, come on. I mean, was that? I mean, let's just talk about that jerk off for a second. I mean, I mean, the kid was from Long Island, an Italian kid from Long Island. Can you believe he did that to me? He did you. That's another. That's a. That's another topic. Got you out of there nice and quick, right? I'm 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 happy that I got ejected uh, like an Austin Powers villain at this point in my life. But the thing I'm most happy about, Rachel, is I got Steve Bannon out of there with me. Okay, because trust me. Those two, hero. those two lunatics together, forget about it. But let's no go. Doubt. Let's go to this, the 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 uh, salty language and the female voter. It's oh yeah, point. that's what I was going to say. People are going to shit their pants when they see what happens in suburban America. Okay, <laughs> like, like I lose my mind kind of because they've got a preview now. Like I thought, like the first time. Okay, I'll catch everyone by surprise, right? I mean, obviously, after arguing all through the summer 
and the fall with like the election Twitter bros about how much suburban America was going to change, not just because like the group of 100 swing voters that voted for Trump are now going to vote for Democrats, which is definitely a factor, but also because there's going to be not just 100 new voters that didn't vote before, but like maybe like 300 of them, and that's going to have a major impact on the vote share, right? It, you know, I thought, okay, I'll catch them by surprise in 18, but like for the 2020 narrative, I won't have that whole space to myself because everyone will fill the space and da da da. But like, really, I, I'm still out there in my, <laughs> you know, because like, like, it's not going to look like 2016 in the suburbs at all. Like, it's going to be a whole different banana. Okay, so he's going to lose. Trump's going to lose. That's your prediction. Yeah, I mean, as long as, uh, as A, as long as the um, polling and things are as they are today, we've got two massive fundamentals working against Donald Trump. Negative partisanship, which is what my forecast stuff is about. And now we have this pandemic effect, which is exasperating that, right? And together, it's about an eight point, you know, advantage for Democrats. And that takes them a pretty deep Senate map, by the way, takes them to that majority that they need to uh, the four seats that they need to get that majority. So, I mean, it, you know, if everyone can vote. And that's why Donald Trump is like, okay, well, I'm losing. So I just have to try to make it, I mean, how how democratic, right? Like small d democratic, right? Right. If I can't win on the numbers, I'll just try to make sure people can't vote. Right. I'm going to try to suppress the vote. I got to turn it over to John. We've got 10 minutes to go in the uh, salt talk, and he's got questions which are lining up in our uh, little chat box there. Go ahead, Mr. Dorsey. So with all the analysis you provided, what is the impact going to be on Senate and House races? How do you expect those to turn out? And what do you expect the effect to be from the national races on those state level, uh, both in the short term and the longer term? Yeah, so, um, you know, to uh, shadow Tim Russert, who I still miss daily, uh, Texas, 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 right? 2019, I put out an analysis. I said, you know, my model is really focused on demographic, college educated population and percent non white. Where is there are still a lot of that that's untapped? And that is Texas, 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 those Dallas and Houston suburbs in particular. Um, of course, there's a couple of districts that they didn't pick up in 2018 and uh, tucking into those Austin gerrymanders. And so I think people are gonna be really shocked to see just how uh, much is gonna happen in that Texas area because it had never been, it's never been competed in. So there's just a lot of potential growth. The state house is nine, it picked up 12 seats in 2018. There's another nine between them and the state house. And I think they have a real strong potential because of the addition of the pandemic effect to, um, to pick it up. So it's going to be, I think, on air, everyone's going to be talking Texas. And then the Senate, you know, Colorado in order, Colorado, Arizona, and then Maine. I mean, Colorado and Arizona, there's just no way to imagine the GOP could come up, uh, ahead on those two Senate seats. And then in Maine, I mean, to, in order for Susan Collins to survive in Maine, you have to believe that there's going to be a significant amount of Maine voters who are in this environment in which, in which you know, ballots are now nationalized, right? And that means the, um, the down ticket candidate is connected to the president. And that back in the days of Obama, that meant the Democratic senator was, you know, their fate was tied to Obama. And now it means the uh, Republican is tied to Trump. And that's, you know, that's ultimately why, um, you know, in Arizona and Colorado, where the demographics are just so strongly in favor of Democrats, they just don't have a hope in, in hell. But in, in Maine, it's a different scenario because it's not a demographic realignment situation. It is a independence kind of scenario. But Maine is 100% going to the Democrats for electoral college for Biden. So you have to believe that a significant chunk of those people are going to vote for Susan Collins. And I just don't see it. I do not see a whole bunch of people splitting their ballot and voting for Joe Biden and seeing Susan Collins in her old maverick way, you know, as this independent check against Trump when she um, has literally failed in that. And there's things like the Lincoln Project making sure voters know it. 
Well, in terms of uh, Trump's strategies for winning, you talked about voter suppression. The other uh, element that's taking place is Kanye West. So they're trying to get him on the ballot in, in several states, including most of the swing states, in hopes that he acts as you know, the, the spoiler that steals right. votes from Biden. Do you think he has the potential to make enough of a difference in those states to, to, to move the needle? So again, I mean, the, the, that strategy and really most of these suppressive efforts are things that can matter in very close elections. Like I, I really urge people, I mean, I hate urging people to buy my book because it's looks really boring. It's not, I promise. I don't do anything that's boring, but it looks boring as hell. And it's titled something really boring. It's called the unprecedented 2016 presidential election, but it really does walk you through the role that uh, third party balloting played in those quite close Midwestern clips, because it's not a story of the Midwest having a political revolution, okay? It's a story of who didn't show up and how many like protest emotive, uh, how much uh, of that occurred naturally. Not all of it was naturally. I, I didn't know at the time that the Russians were working those two audiences pretty hard with propaganda. And the Trump campaign is replicating that strategy. That's what the Death Star is about. So for two years, I've been trying to get people to understand it's a subtraction campaign. It's not an addition campaign. You can't run a persuasion campaign around Donald Trump because he would undermine it every single moment of every single day anyway. So, you know, to be fair to the Trump campaign, you have to kind of work with the mold, the clay that you have, right? And he is um, the first candidate at either at the Senate competitive level or the president who forces the campaign into a purely mobilization strategy. And so they have to do things that are ethically disgusting, like look like, okay, well, we need, a, we need someone to siphon off votes from the Democrats. How do we do it? You know, we, we hope that Bernie Sanders, you know, has a really divisive primary and we can um, point for, you know, we can micro-target progressives on those YouTube shows that are on serious radio and get them, you know, tell them not to vote or tell them to vote third party and that they're going to spend millions of dollars on that stuff. And then the other way to do it is to get black voters to do the same. We're going to, you know, tell black voters that Joe Biden has this complicated history with race and the crime bill and try to get them to vote against their own self-interest. And yeah, it can matter if the election gets really close in Michigan and 10,000 people write in. You don't need a um, candidate on the ballot when they're famous and everyone knows their name. So uh, it can still be an effective tool at write in. It's certainly not, I think, the GOP's first choice. I think they would have preferred like a, you know, something a little bit more like a libertarian that was attractive. Like Gary Johnson, I mean, that dude stole a, a lot of votes on the left just by being pro pot. I mean, everyone's like, oh, he's the dude that smokes pot, right? <laughs> like, so, you know, it's, it's, it, it, is, um, it is not ethically, but, but hey, you know, you just watched a convention that broke laws and ev uh, many ethics. I mean, you know, we are living in strange times. We'll leave you with one last question before we let you go, Rachel. If you were the DNC and you only had a finite amount of resources to spend over the next uh, 70 days or whatever it is until the election. Would you focus on trying to swing those 5% of actual swing voters? Or would you focus on trying to uh, push turnout among the coalition of Democratic voters that you talked about before? Well, it should never be an either or, right? You should be doing both at all times. But if I was running the DNC, a lot of things would be different. I mean, number one, I would have spent the last four years building basically a, a war machine, and it would have be um, dead. Let me make that clear, dead okay, to the GOP's ambitions to ever control the presidency or Congress again. But I don't, uh, and you know, in the triage format, what I would do is I would make it, I would make my persuasion campaign a sniper strategy and not a, um, a shotgun, which is like shooting with tons of different messages. And that sniper campaign would be, Donald Trump screwed up the pandemic response, right? Here's specifically what he did compared to how other people dealt with it. This is why we have a raging pandemic and a permanently impaired economy. And on top of that, the GOP and Trump will not give you any aid, right? And that's what I would focus that on. Like, um, I would really be painting the Republican Party as a party of extremists and winning um, middle America on that message. And then the rest of my money 
would be spent on making sure my, um, you know, at the end of the day, if you want to win Wisconsin or a house district, it doesn't matter what it is. If you want to win it, you can, if 70% of Republicans in that district turn out, you damn well better have 70% of Democrats turn out too, right? So you want to make sure you're spending a lot of money on turning out that voter file. And, um, you know, that's where that resource should be focused. Well, thanks so much for joining us, Rachel. Anthony, do you have any final word for Rachel? No, I, we're, going to, we're going to be tracking you, Rachel. I, I just wrote down the book. Give us the title of the book again. I don't have a copy of it in front of me, but I'm going to order it on Amazon when this is over. What's the title? It's called of the, book? the Unprecedented 2016 Presidential Election. And uh, yeah, it is an academic book, so it looks really boring. But it isn't boring, I promise. And it actually is the only book, in my opinion, that actually will tell you what really happened in 2016. All right. Well, you're, you're terrific. We'll have to see what happens over the next uh, 60 or so days. Uh, um, I, uh, I try to make these things less partisan, if you will. So I didn't go too off on my own personal opinions, Rachel. So uh, we'll save that <laughs> for the next time you and I are on the Bill Maher show together. There you go. Uh, yeah, I, well, it's hard I, to sound nonpartisan in the Trump era, though, buddy. Yeah, no, it's that, that's very true. I'm just trying to keep it neutral, you know, like, yep. like salt itself. Everybody likes salt, Rachel. <laughs> right, everybody who doesn't yeah I, I have a high sodium diet myself but anyway <laughs> god bless uh thank right. you and i look forward to seeing you maybe we can have you back uh closer to the election and then or perhaps after the election so that we can get your analysis of what actually happened yeah no i'm happy to do either or both and uh you know i'm happy to talk to your audience i hope and assume it, it's an audience that has a lot of potential to impact america for good and i have a lot of stuff that i'm doing uh, nope. related to that. So I would love to talk about some of that stuff. No, no question about it. God bless. Sending you lots of love. All right. Well. Thanks.